Hi, I'm Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephanie DePaz, who's a spine uh, surgery consultant at Eiffel Clinic, St. Brigida, Germany. Today, we're going to touch on two super exciting topics. The first one is a new hybrid technique uh, that involves single level fusion with tethering. And Dr. DePaz is going to go into detail with that with a case study. And we're also going to look at uh, a lateral disc release that we're going to look at some intraoperative video as well. Dr. Papaz, would you like to take it from there? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me again. Um, so yeah, um, we all know that we had some troubles with uh, tether rupture and then a progression of scoliosis. And uh, we had some patients coming back for revision, especially for the lumbar curves. And then for the revision uh, cases, we started to doing an apical fusion of the lumbar um, disc, usually it's L1 to L2, and then retethering basically on top of it. And since that worked so well and the patients recovered so good that we actually started um, this technique for selective patients in uh, primary cases as well. And I um, can pull up a little PowerPoint for you where I kind of walk you through how we do this. Okay, so um, first of all, I wanna let everybody know that what we're doing is off-label. So what that means, that this um, cage or the disc replacement that we use for the fusion, um, it has been used before, but it's not, um, it doesn't have the indication for immature patients and it um, has never been used with a tether before. So it's an off-label use. So in case you're thinking about the possibility, you just have to know that. So that's the, the cage we're using. It's from Globus as well. It's called a transcontinental. And here you can see on the right side, it's kind of elliptical um, shaped. It comes in from the same incision that we do the tethering with. So it's, there's no need for further skin incision. And here um, on, the mid, on, the, on the second picture, you can see how it kind of looks like when it's in the spine. And that's an, air, an axial view. So basically cutting from the top. So the front is the front and the back is the back and kind of comes from the side. We take out the disc and then it just lays in there. And then we put the tether on the side and tension the tether. Um, that's just an explanatory um, x-ray, how it looks like. So it's peak, so that means we cannot see it in the x-ray. So the industry helps us that they have those little um, pins in it so we can uh, see where it is actually lying on an x-ray, okay? So now I wanna walk you through a, a patient that we did um, use this technique in primary. Um, surgery. So this is a young lady here. She had a lumbar curve, uh, left convex lumbar curve. We did a lumbar VBT and she has a lot of rotation in her lumbar curve, as you can see. She's fairly mature. She's uh, kind of at the end of her growth. And furthermore, if you take a look at the one, two disc space here, I'll zoom in for you. On the bending views, it kind of goes from being wedge shaped to being only parallel, okay? So that means the disc is not really opening up to the other side as we would want it to happen in a, in, for a VBT case. So we want a lot of flexibility. Nevertheless, it would be a shame or we think it would be a shame to fuse her lumbar spine. So what we then did in the same procedure with the tethering, we did, uh, we replaced this one disc with the transcontinental disc replacement, so with the cage. So here you can see those little pins again. So we did the tether, two rows of tethering, as you can see here, and then we replaced this one disc, basically sacrificed this one disc, just to bring that X to stability and to hope that this will help that the tethering will last longer. And if there would be a rupture, it would not come to a progression of the scoli. And that is just a zoom up of the X-ray. So here again, you can see those pins. You have the screws up on the top and you will have on the side there two um, tethers lying on top and being tensioned on top of this um, disc replacement. Just a follow-up question, Dr. Lepaz. So if, you're, if it was a very flexible spine, and the X-ray on the left shows the uh, pie-shaped disc, wedge-shaped disc, and the bending X-rays on the right show parallel, so ideally, you would want to see uh, an opposite wedge if the spine was opening and then it was flexible. Is that correct? 
That is correct, because um, if you would see that it opens up to the other side, so meaning it would kind of the pyramid would be lying on the other side, that means that the disk is highly flexible. Yeah. Now, with respect to um, the uh, disk that is replaced, do you remove completely the disk? So it's a discectomy, uh, all the tissues removed. So it's just correct. The end plates are removed as well. Yeah, well, the, the end plates are being, well, basically the disc is being scraped off the end plate. Yeah. And then um, the annulus on the other side is also being removed. So we make sure that actually disc will, will become parallel and it, there's an, uh, it will fuse with time. Yeah. How do you prepare the disc space? Uh, you, you scrape out, you want to make sure that there is no disc in the disc space anymore because the disc is a bit of a jelly tissue and it does two things. Well, once it prevents the fusion or it prolongs the fusion. And then second, it might make the implant being a little bit loose within the disc space available. So you, as long as you have bone disc replacement and then bone, it's a really solid construct because you can compress it down, but then the disc is more jelly tissue. So it, you cannot really compress it on it. So you gotta make sure that the disc is, you actually take it all the way out as much as you can. Now, it seems that with the that particular device that it just fits in to about the middle two thirds of the disc space, right? What happens to the gaps on the edges? Do those fill in with bone eventually? So it does. Um, so the, you mean the front and the back part? Is that yeah. what you're talking about? It will fuse, right? Because we there's the disc. It's quite a lot, a big uh, disc replacement. So in there, the bone will just grow through it. So it will fuse, even though there's a little bit of a gap in the front and in the back here, yeah, you're right. But we do put pressure on, right? Because with the tether, we actually pressure it down. And do you fill the gap with uh, bone as well? or? That's... Yeah, it's uh, we don't have, we don't have, yeah, bone, but it's a replacement. So it's a kind of a bone stimulating tissue that we put in there, yeah. It's basically calcium and different minerals. Mm -hmm. How long does it usually take for fusion to take to take hold? And well, if in the normal fusion cases without the tether, it's uh, six months to eight months, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't know exactly how this works with the tether. Uh, we hope that th there's enough tension on the tether that it will actually fuse, and then of course the patients are usually healthy and young, so that definitely helps. Uh, but I would probably say anything between three months or six months until it's really solid. Okay. Now I know yeah. it's with some fusions, uh, some surgeons believe that uh, they like more of a bone on bone uh, yeah. a construct where the disc is removed completely and yeah. one vertebrae sits on top of the other. Exactly. But that I can understand will uh, just the diameter of uh, uh, neuroforamin for instance, Correct. For coming out. Correct. Is that the reason primarily for using yeah. uh, this protection? Yeah, one of the reasons, right? Yeah. yeah, one of the reasons. Because we're doing this in a lumbar spine. So if I have, let's say, if you, if I would have a patient who's like in, a, in his 20s and needs a type of fusion, I would never do bone on bone because I would be worried that the neuroforam would be narrow after this and he would have radicular pain. Um, so I would not want to do this and I wouldn't want to have this myself, to be honest. Now, um, I understand the rationale basically to add more stability. Have you, you've been doing this for probably about a year now, correct? Yeah, about a year. We started about a year ago for a revision case, and as I said, and uh, since it worked so well and we were so happy with the first outcomes, um, we did a few cases now as primary um, BBT cases as well. Have you found that, uh, well, you walk through it in terms of the biomechanics. Have you found that it ideally it does put less uh, pressure on the tether uh, because you have that stable level now with the fusion? So I, I think it does relieve the tether because what we do is we fuse the apex of the curve. So the tether nevertheless is tensioned, but it has to hold the tension for a um, small amount of time because eventually it will fuse. So um, the tether would not need to hold the tension on the apex as much. So I hope it actually can, this technique hopefully will control the apex of the curve better.
and you're only doing this for uh, primary lumbar curves at this point, because I know Correct. most. It seems like most of your uh, patients are interested in the uh, lumbar curves as opposed to. Correct. The... Yeah, we don't do this in the thoracic spine. No, that's for a lumbar spine. I guess the question I have with respect to this is that typically fusion on the left side, they'll they'll do, they'll fuse to levels, right, and they'll put. I guess two rods in there to make it stable. Correct, correct. With the tether, uh, press the forces will also hold the disc in place. So there's there's no risk of that particular device uh, being uh, able to move or being too loose. Oh, there's a risk for sure. There's a risk. Mm -hmm. um, so we spend a lot of time in preparing the disc space for this. And then, um, tension down the tether but i think i think um of course there's a risk especially if you take a look at the normal fusions there's kind of compression on both sides right mm -hmm. um because where you can see the the screws now there will be rods in the end right to hold it basically in place and you can compress down um and that's that doesn't happen with the tether obviously in a tether we only have compression on the convex side of the curve so of course there's a risk that you know if we would be too aggressive maybe with our preparation that this um, cage might dislocate towards the other side. So we're really careful with this. So we take, a, I would say for each disc replacement like this, I just, ex the, there's no need for further incisions, but it does make the surgery a little bit longer just because we take a lot of time and uh, to prepare the disc space so that everything is really solid. Well, I can understand how um, with using this implant, and using uh, the release on the lateral that you're basically uh, just opening up on one side of the, uh, of, the, of the spine of the structure to remove the disc. So you'll have three ends that are basically holding the disc in there. And then on the, and the fourth, fourth end where you've actually uh, incised, that's being held down by the tether. So it sounds like it's a stable entity. It, it. I hope it is, because like I mean, inside you during the surgery, it looks extremely stable. In terms of um, parameters for this particular hybrid technique, uh, you see this more as a uh, technique for more uh, mature adolescent spines. Are you going to take this more into adult spines as well? I think. I think this. At the moment, we're considering this for more mature patients um, who have a curve that would need a fusion probably in the future. Um, but we also think it's kind of borderline for tethering. When you, what was the evolution of this technique? I know you were considering doing revisions and is it something that just came up in a study group or how did it, how did it evolve? Uh, I think it started with one patient that came back uh, for a lumbar revision because of a tether rupture and basically um, was a, a young boy and he walked in or a young man and he walked in and said, I, I want to just have a retether. And by that time, his L1 to disc was just pretty stiff already. Um, and we walked him through fusion and he was adamant that he doesn't want to have a fusion for sure. So we thought about what if we just sacrifice this really one disc and take it out and then we tether and hope that then the tether would last longer and it would give him this extra stability towards the apex. Yeah, and then we just, we are lucky enough that we are, we are allowed to do this in Germany as long as it's informed consent and the patient understands that this is all off-label use of the implant. Um, so then we went ahead and then we were so happy with the x-rays that we just think that this might be the solution for our tether rupture problem, basically. So he was your first patient with this type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did he have pain before, after uh, the tether no. or anything? No. So he was... No. So um, if you take, if you compare our normal VBT patients mm -hmm. to the patients where we do epic fusion with this one cage, there's no difference in the pain level, no difference in the blood loss. It's um, the, the, the it's a bit more surgical work, so it takes a little bit longer, but the pain levels are the same. Fascinating. Yeah, it is.
and I can tell you that you're super excited about uh, what you're seeing for the patient, right? Yeah, we, we, of course, you know, of course we came up with this and uh, now what we need is we need to have a few patients who are like one or two years um, after surgery to be able to say that this is a good idea or it's not. Mm. Yeah, and of course we, so far uh, we didn't have any complications. So there's been no implant that kind of slipped towards the other side or, uh, you know, nothing happened so far. So we're really careful. It's not like we, um, we don't want to have any complications doing this at this stage, yeah. Right. I think that's probably a good segue into how you remove the disc or in this, yeah. in this case, a uh, lateral disc release. So this, just for everyone, these are interruptive uh, videos. So uh, there's a little bit of blood involved, not too, too bad, but if you cannot, if, you know, if somebody's sensitive, you maybe shouldn't watch this. Um, so here is a thoracic case. So we are in a thorax on the left side here. It's the lung. That's just a, this metal piece is a retractor holding the lung. The lung is collapsed when we work on the thoracic spine. Uh, the golden ones here, the golden screws, they're the back row of the screws. And the kind of silver, silver in the front there, um, they're the one, the anterior um, screw line. So I want to walk you through how we do a disc release. So here we start. So did we incising the pleura on the height of the disc? Kind of like this. And then you can see the little bit of the white bit. That's the annulus coming through. So we kind of push the pleura aside. Then we incise the lateral annulus only of the disc. And then you can see how it kind of starts gonna start bulging towards us. Sorry for the lights. Each time we, we work with headlights, so each time we the surgeon actually looks into it, it kind of becomes a bit blurry. So now we take out the little, like a window um, from the annulus and take it out. So that's quite a, that's a rough tissue there. That's why we have to pull on it and incise it with a, with a knife before. And again, that's still all annulus that we take out. And now you can already see here kind of a little bit of a jelly structure. That's actually, it's either part of the nucleus or just a disc. So we just open up that window towards the back. The back is here, front is here, lung tissue again. And now we just uh, cauterize a little bit. And you can see it's not bleeding at all. So now we take a dissector and I just wanna stop here for a second. So we can, we can now put the dissector in and then we can actually turn it 90 degrees and there's enough space for the dissector to be fully turned, okay? Just keep that in mind as I will show you in the next video. So this is it, this is already kind of the, a disc, re disc release, a lateral disc release. And now um, I show you what happens after the tensioning in the next video. So it's the same patient. Again, the golden screws are the one that are on the, the posterior screws in the back. Those are the silver ones in the front. We have one tether in place and the second tether in the second row. Lung tissue on the left. And here will be, would be the ribs from the inside, basically. And here you can see we have done one disc release here. And then the tether is on top, right? And it's already tension. And here you can see if we try to put the, 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 the sector inside, you cannot really turn it anymore because due to the tensioning of the tether, this, it has kind of closed that gap that we created before and that was there before due to the scoliosis. Yeah, and that's it. So that's our interruptive videos of disc, disc releases. Thanks so much for showing that. It's uh, that's a first, that's a scoop in terms of uh, 
content information. Now you can actually see what, what's happening. Um, after the past, I was wondering if we could go back just to, to see. To the video? Yeah. I guess what the first uh, question that jumps to mind is, why are there two different types of uh, screws? One, yeah. Because uh, they're different shape, um, they're different size. It's a, it's a good question. So they're color coded, right? So the back row, it's a six five screw, and this is a five five screw. So um, the six five screw is a, it's thicker and it's gold, and it does have the staple as you can see here. Mm -hmm. So for the back row of screws, we use the six five of a staple to make it really stable. And as you probably already know, Derek, the most of the tension is actually on the, on the posterior screws or on the posterior tether, I should say. Uh, and this is more the front row, it's more supportive row. So we always say we put 50% of the tension on the, on the, on the first, um, on the front row of screws. So this screw does not have a washer and it's a bit smaller. It doesn't have a washer also because there's less space or is it it's just uh, yeah. need, need it because it's only 50% tension? So I think two reasons, both, both reasons basically. So I don't think you need it because you don't tension as much. So you don't need the extra stability the washer or the staple um, would give you. Um, it's also not bicortical. So the first row, it's not a bi bicortical purchase, whereas the back row, we, um, we want to have a bicortical purchase for the stability. Okay. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, is it just experience that you know to tension this, the uh, anterior cord by 50% or is is there, is there data that's anything that that's kind of the right uh, amount? You would, you know, with basically what you, most of the time we use is in the in the lumbar spine, right? So usually in the lumbar spine we always do two two rows of screws. So um, the worry, of course, is that if you put too much tension on the first row, so on the anterior screw line, that you will actually take away low doses of the lumbar spine, right? So you for sure don't want to kind of create less lordosis in the lumbar spine. So that's why you don't want to put too much tension on the anterior row. Okay. Now, when you do place the disc uh, with the device, um, do you find that that alters the tensioning at all? Or is it about the same as, as without uh, using the apical fusion? Yeah, I don't think it alters the tensioning. It feels the same, that's for sure. Um, but of course, you. You just you you move the disc replacement. You make sure that this disc will stay parallel, or the cage will stay parallel. Um, yeah, but it doesn't doesn't feel different. The tension is the same. All right. I guess the uh, one concern about, and I have to bring this up, there's always a little bit of controversy regarding disc release. In terms 100%, of, yeah. In terms of, if you um, incise the disc, will that lead to um, uh, auto fusion pain in the future. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, first of all, we don't do disc releases in the lumbar spine. So um, this those lateral disc releases, we only do in the thoracic spine. In the thoracic spine, we only take out the annulus. We do not take out the disc and we do not take out the nucleus. So I don't think it will lead to an auto fusion because the whole disc is basically still in place. As you can see in the videos that we don't take out the disc, it's just the annulus. So um, it might create some kind of scarring on the annulus and that might provide a bit of more stability. I do not think that in our technique, it will lead to an auto fusion, no. Is but it, I do understand the concern, especially if you do this for the lumbar spine. Why is it more of a concern for lumbar disc uh, releases than it is for thoracic disc releases? If you do a, a lumbar disc release, it might lead to a quicker degeneration of the um, lumbar discs, right? So you don't want that to happen. And the lumbar discs are just more mobile. So they're, you need them more, you know. As you know, most of the disc herniations actually occur in the lumbar spine. With the with tethering uh, and tether ruptures, it seems to be around twenty percent for uh, mm -hmm. the at least, right? And have you? I know that um, tether technology is is evolving. Do you have any updates on new tethers availability or anything coming down the line in the near future? Uh, so we have been using the the thicker tether of Globus lately. So there's a 
the five millimeter tether that we've been using. And we just started using it in August. So I have no idea if it's actually gonna um, decrease our tether rupture or not. Uh, but I have no further information of further production or like a change in the tether structure or anything. It's just a one millimeter thicker than it's, it's the same feel, same yeah. material. It's the same feel, same material. It's just the same thing, just thicker. That's how it feels like, yeah. Okay. After the past, do you have any uh, comments you'd like to end the interview on? It's a fascinating technique. Just love the evolution of um, the disc release and the apical fusion. It's not for everyone. And uh, everybody has to be aware that this off label use. And uh, as I, I think it's as long as the surgeon and the team is being safe and patient safety is being kept, you know, it's the most important thing above everything. And then the family knows what, uh, what it means that this is an off label use, I think, then uh, that it would be a possible co consideration doing some uh, epical fusion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but see, um, really curious how wh where this is going to lead in the future so um, we should redo this interview in five years time and maybe maybe i will tell you not to do this or maybe we evolve a little bit more with the technique i don't know sure absolutely it's an evolving space i guess yeah. I, I do have one question that i often get from um, um, parents or patients with scoliosis and regarding tethering versus fusion i guess yeah for instance, if we take a lumbar fusion and versus a lumbar tether, and yeah. I think that's why so many are considering, even for uh, older patients, lumbar tethers, because I think they, they, they're basically saying, well, if you're going to fuse my lumbar spine, um, I'm going to try and do um, a non-fusion technique because if that fails, I can always fuse later. Is there... Is that a logical train of thought? I can understand the train of thought, and we do hear it a lot in the clinic. Mm -hmm. I think it, uh, you re really have to take a look at how flexible is your spine at this stage, actually, right? Because you'd be surprised how many patients come in their 30s asking for a tether, and then we take a look at their bending views, and there's like virtually no flexibility anymore. So there's no possibility for tether. So by a fusion, I would not take away the mobility because there is none in the mm. first place. So I think that's what people have to understand. A VBT cannot give you mobility if there's none. So you need to have a flexible and mobile spine to even think about it in the first place. I think that's kind of my logic behind this as well. Well, that's an excellent point. Um, but some patients will say, okay, if I have, I'm, I'm 30, I have a stiffer uh, lumbar spine. Um, and if I fuse, whatever discs are there are going to be stiff anyway, right? So if I do a disc release from my lumbar spine, will that increase flexibility? No, nope. no, Chris. I so do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. So you think about, oh, uh, we do a little bit of a tether and take out the disc on the side, and maybe we're going to get this extra mobility. But there's so much more around the spine, right? The facet joints are arthrotic; they're stiff. You know, um, it's not just, the, you cannot just take a little bit of the annulus and think you're gonna have a mobile spine again, right? So that's not how it works, unfortunately. I'm glad you brought it up because I know even with um, some disc release, uh, if there's, you know, if the disc in the first place is too thin, uh, if you have yeah. other surrounding structures, if the, if the vertebrae are wedged and there's not, yeah you're going to be able to do with remove the soft tissue of a disc to free up. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think we are all like as surgeons, we are all excited about the possibility of keeping something mobile and flexible that is meant to be mobile and flexible. Um, you know, that's why I think we need to develop the technique of BBT further, but it has to be mobile and flexible to keep it like this. I think that's kind of where we are at this stage. Oh, it makes complete sense. And I, I really value your perspective on that because I haven't, I, I think talking to surgeons before, I kind of suspected that, but to actually uh, verbalize it, it, it makes it very, very uh, apparent that you have to have flexibility to have a non-fusion surgery to begin with. 
Exactly. And I also think it's really good for the patients because a lot of patients are just, they hear fusion um, and it just scares them away. And I think then you need to show them and in their bending views or however you want to show it to them or you're able to explain. I usually tend to do bending exercise just to make it really close or clear to them that even if I fuse them, I'm not taking away mobility because there is no mobility in the first place. You know, I think people just have to understand this and you just got to make it really clear for them to, to take away that fear of being stiff. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Defaz. Really appreciate it. Thank really you, Derek. Really enjoyed the interoperative videos. It was the first and um, super excited to see where the apical fusion hybrid goes from here. Looking forward to our interview in five years, yeah. okay? <laughs> in five years time, exactly. <laughs> That's going to be great. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye, Derek. Bye.